what logic are you looking for for the Trinity to not make sense to you? What I would say is that a, I would say, it would be like a clear logical contradiction. Like for for example. Sure, I'll give you one. Can humans lie, Ryan? Can humans lie? Sure. Is that a yes or no? I need yeah, yes, or yes, no? yes, 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 yes. Can God lie? No. Can Jesus lie? Jesus cannot lie. But was he fully human? Yeah. If he's fully human, then he must have the ability to lie, right? Because you told me humans can lie, right? You said yes to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's try it again. Can humans lie? Mm, yes. Can God lie? No. Can Jesus lie? Mm, no. Then You're breaking your own not... logic, bro. Hello. Hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. What's in your mind today? On my mind? Yep. Not this special. Um, I'm here, like, I'm here to, like, test my faith. <laughs> like, if... What is your faith? I'm a Christian. Okay. And how confident are you about your faith? Because you, you seem to say you want to test your faith. How confident are you? Uh, I'm pretty confident, but I want to be sure that I'm not confident in ignorance. <laughs> okay. No, that's that's a good approach. I mean, it's challenging yourself and to see whether, you know, it, it, it stands to scrutiny. I mean, this is a noble thing to do. There's no, it's not anything objectionable in that way. So when you say you're a Christian, what is your understanding of Christ in relation to God? How do you see Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, in relation to God? What's what's his position with relation to God? Mm, I believe he's the begotten son of God. Okay. So you believe God begets sons or daughters and he's uh, a son that he's begotten. And when you when you say begotten, it's a very archaic English word. Uh, do you want to explain in simple modern English what do you mean by the word begotten? Um, simply say like um, Jesus comes directly from the Father. He comes okay. directly from God. Okay. So is this some kind of emanation? He emanates. You know, you have a sun and the rays come from the sun. The rays emanates from the sun. But the rays are part of the sun. Sun as in sun and moon, right? S-U-N. So is Jesus emanating from the Father? Something like that? Or is he a simply a description of one of his attributes? Like God has wisdom. He has knowledge. He has word or speech. And Jesus is either the Logos, the wisdom, or the speech of God. When, how, how do you see Jesus in relation to God as in the father okay um like the thing is i think i don't think it's quite just easy like an emanation i think like he's like comes from like he has the same nature as the father the scripture do identify him as the logos you don't identify uh, the logos in some sense logos of who like the, the logos of god in this case will be the father logos. So, so you have father who has certain attributes because without any attributes you won't know who he is right like yeah, for sure. example he has love mm -hmm. he has knowledge yeah these are the attributes is jesus an attribute of god mm, no no okay so what is he then like i said he's the he's a begotten son he comes from god they have the same nature no no when you say comes from remember god who is, who is the father to you mainly yeah. he has attributes like he speaks god's speech the speech of god is an attribute yeah jesus christ is a son now is this son s-o-n an attribute of god no no i said no okay so what is he then like as you said it he's a son <laughs> the no, no, when you say when you say son look is he a part of God? Like, you know, you know, you have arms and legs which are part of your body. Mm. Yeah, that's your part. So when you have God the Father and you have Jesus, how is Jesus the Son related to the Father? What is he exactly? What's the 
difference between the father and the son? The difference is one is unbegotten, the other is begotten. If I could make it easy, I'm Orthodox Christian. I'm Eastern Orthodox. So yeah, yeah. still, yeah. still, we need to understand because yeah. you're saying you're saying the father is God, okay, mm -hmm. and the son is begotten of this God. Oh, the, oh, the, the, yeah, and being begotten by God, he has the same nature as the father. So by default, he cannot have the same nature. Why? Because the father's nature is not beget, uh, not begotten. The father isn't begotten, is he? So uh, what? So what you say is um. Is the father begotten? begotten? Is the father? Yeah. Let's, let's, the father is not begotten. The father is not begotten. Right. Yeah. So the nature of the father is not begotten. What and, the say that, the, and the nature of the son is begotten. So they have different natures. What we will say to that is, uh, being begotten and unbegotten applies to the person, the hypostasis, not the nature. The nature, the and nature they, of the, the nature of the father is independent. No, I say that the, like begotten and begotten applies to the person who. Let's go back to another nature. Is the nature of the father independent, yeah. self-sufficient? The nature of the father is in. Is he is he independent and self-sufficient? Is that part of his nature? Nature of father. I'll say. I'll say yes. Okay. Anyone that is begotten by someone else, they are dependent on someone begetting them, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the son is dependent on the father begetting the son. So you have the father who is independent and you have the son who is dependent. Yeah, but in your language, you said someone, that's what, that's what we say in order of that. The person of the son is begotten. Yeah. The be per begotten. yeah like One person is independent. Yeah. And another person is dependent. Yeah, but they nature. have yeah. Different nature. Person. It's not the same. Like you made a person nature distinction. I think you guys uh, it's a, it's the a person. person. So you have different things you're dealing with, different persons. One yeah, is person. one yeah. is self sufficient. Yeah, and one is the other same. one is not self sufficient, not sufficient by himself. He needs the father. Just like the father needs the son to be the father. If the father needs the son for his own existence, then he is not God. Then he's not self-sufficient. So let's start with the existence. Is the father self-sufficient for his existence? If you mean by self-sufficient, is it on cost, cost, I'll say yes. No. It's is he cost. sufficient for his own existence or does he need someone to give him life and existence? in this existence the but father exists right do you yeah. believe he exists okay. yeah and, and he's the father because he has the son so like the that. father exists for the existence of the father is the father dependent on someone else or something else for his existence it's not something else is that the same god like the father because the anything son. anything other than himself anything other than the father is the father dependent on Because if he's dependent on someone else, something else, even a person or a hypostasis or a persona, it doesn't matter. He will stop being God because God is the only being who is self-sufficient by definition. Yeah, that's what is a, that's a being, that's a, a distinction between being and person. Wait, wait, any existence, any existence you want to call God, that existence must be self-sufficient. Yeah. The, 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 the divine nature of God is self-sufficient. Wait, we're talking world. about the Father. Don't jump to God now. The Father. The, the Father, Father exists. He has an existence. For his existence, is he independent or dependent? The existence is independent. So the Father, for his own existence, he's independent. Sure. That's, good. That's, good. That's good. Really good. good. The Son, for his existence... Is he independent or dependent? The son, no, no the, the son takes his existence from the father. There you go. He's a dependent thing. Anything that is dependent is not God, cannot be God, will not be God. Okay. The past, present, and future, I eliminated all of the time frames. He can never be God, either in the past or in the future or in the present. Anyone who's dependent on anyone else. 
the only being your heart and mind, Ryan, will accept as being God is one who is self-sufficient, independent. And this is what the Quran describes in chapter 112. Shaykh will explain. Uh, uh, Do you want to just give our friend Ryan a quick understanding of uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas? And then Brother Ijaz and Brother Muris can explain a bit more. Then you'll realize why Christian orthodoxy that you have uh, explained in your belief is not something that's sensible to believe in. But when what the Quran presents rather is what is sensible, reasonable, and your heart will accept it. And by this, inshallah, we invite you to Islam to accept that, if that makes sense. Tafadal, ya Sheikh. Barakallahu fiq, zadallahu fiq, fadlik. Ryan, did you understand what uh, Brother Mansoor has just said to you? Mm, I understand where it's coming from. No, no, not where he's coming from. Did you understand what he has just explained to you? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, I get it because I also had those doubts before, but I think doesn't, I think it doesn't apply completely to the whole concept of the Trinity. But I'm We're still with it. About the Trinity. We're not talking about the Trinity. Did you understand what he has explained to you? The dependent, yeah. but something which depends on something yeah, 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 will sure. never be a god yeah mm. yeah yeah, never yeah be independent yeah. pardon will never be independent will never be independent jazakallahu khairan now so this is without even going to the trinity so by just saying that in islam allah jalla wa ala is independent is self-sufficient is uh, he doesn't depend, he doesn't beget or begot. He's not begotten, he doesn't beget. Allah Jalla wa ala is the one, is a monotheistic God, is a God. It's like in the Bible, like in the Old Testament, nothing like unto him. He is immortal, he is unique, he is the greatest, he is omniscient, he is omnipotent, he is omnipresent. And by what I mean by omnipresent, I don't mean that he is everywhere. He is everywhere with his knowledge. No, not... no, what you mean. <clears throat> okay. So these things, I'm afraid Jesus, Isa, peace be upon him, hasn't got them. Do you agree to that? So this is this is my point of contention. No, no, before before we move to your point, what I say to you, do you agree to, to what I said that Jesus, uh, Isa, peace be upon him, is not omnipresent, is not omniscient, is not omnipotent, is not the greatest, is not immortal? Do you agree to these things? I won't because I believe he's God. <laughs> you, you are not even listening to the question. <laughs> no, no, he said, said if I agree, if... Jesus is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He's saying he's that he's not that he's not. That's it. I don't he's, agree with it. So these are the attributes. For example, omnipotence. You know, it's um, the fact that he's immortal. All these are attributes of God Almighty. But mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't have them. Jesus, Jesus has that. Like you, Jesus says, you, 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 every. You think Jesus is immortal? Hmm? Was Jesus Do you think immortal? that Jesus is immortal? Yeah. So who died on the cross? He said it. The human. No, no, also. not what no, died. Wait, wait, not wait, what wait. died. The human what? No, 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 no. Died. Jesus who did died. Who died? Died. Yeah. Yeah. Who died? Who died? Who died? Not what Jesus. died. Who died? Jesus. No, no, Jesus died. The question again. Repeat the question, Shrek. Who died on the on, cross? Yeah, the person who died was Jesus. Okay, so Jesus, the person. The person. No, no, he said the person. Can God mm. die? God, can God die? If you mean cease to exist, he cannot die. No, if you are immortal, can you die? Yeah, yeah. If you are immortal, you cannot, if you are that you cannot die. Okay, okay. so but Jesus died die? on the cross, didn't he? Jesus died on the cross. According to his humanity. No, no, but you said the person died. So the second person of the Trinity died. Do you agree? Yeah, the second person of the Trinity experienced death on the cross. Good. Did the first person ever die? So he's not immortal. So he's not immortal. So we dropped one. So he's not. he cannot be immortal. 
Now let's go to omniscient. Is the second of the uh, person of the Trinity is he omniscient? No, wait. Let's wait on the emote. I don't. I, he didn't. He, Jesus never ceased to exist. He, he was still there. He was. He never had a be. Doesn't have a beginning. Doesn't have an end. We humans, we are not immortal okay, in the okay. sense that we wait, have. Wait, a wait, 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 wait. Uh, how does he not have a beginning? And John one one says, "In the beginning was the Word." So he has a beginning. In the and the word was with God. No, hang on. Just, you just, just say it doesn't say, say in the beginning the word. Ryan, began. Ryan, Ryan. Yeah. You just said he has no beginning, no end, which yeah. is not correct because John one one says mm -hmm. in the beginning. So he put him in a beginning. In the beginning was the word. Was the word. So he was, the word was with, uh, with God, and the word was God. So so John one one. The prologue gives him a beginning. That verse simply says he was there at the beginning. It doesn't say if he began there also. at the beginning. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know who Melchizedek is, Ryan? Do you know who Melchizedek is? Hmm? Please, can you repeat? Melchizedek. Do you know who he is? Melchizedek. Yeah, no, yeah. He has got no beginning, no end, no genealogy. Yeah, that, no that's, mother, he's got no mother, no father, he's God. No, that's already referring to to his priesthood because nobody knows where his priesthood came or, or where it went. And they're liking his priesthood no, to the priesthood it's of Christ. referring to Melchizedek, not, not his priesthood. Yeah, the reference of Melchizedek in Hebrews, he was talking yes. about, it's, it's, it's in context about his priesthood. Nobody knows no, where he came from, where Melchizedek, he went. Melchizedek has no mother, no father, no genealogy. And he has no beginning of days, no end of time. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the one the, the interpretation it, it refers that talking that, that when, when you continue reading, it refers to his priesthood. No, it that's doesn't. Because, because the, that, in fact, because, the priest the priesthood is his role. Yeah, this and the priesthood is, his, is, and, is, and the priesthood is the genealogy. Since we don't no, know his no, father, it's, or it's his got mother. nothing to do. Priesthood is actually based on the genealogy of whom? Do you know in Hebrew? Uh, among yeah, the, the Levite, the Levite. Exactly. So don't say it's got to do with his uh, with his uh, priesthood. Priesthood does you said from Levites, okay? Mm -hmm. From from Aaron, right? Yeah, but good. The, so the it point does, is just it does have genealogy, so your so your response is incorrect. So now the second thing. It, he has no beginning of days, no end of time. Is there anyone other than God Almighty who has these attributes? No, which is why, which is why I say the, the verse about Melchizedek is in a specific context. It's not talking about it. It, it, it says context? every way. Okay. We, don't, we don't know his father and mother. We don't know, we don't know nothing about him. Listen, listen. In what yeah. context can Melchizedek have no beginning of days or no end of time? In what context? Yeah, in the context that nobody knows his, nobody knows sorry, his mother sorry, in the or father. What? In the context that nobody knows his mother nor father. No, no, you said, you said in a certain context. I'm asking you, in what context does he not have a beginning of days or end of time? Yeah, if if you don't know his mother, you don't know when he was born. If you don't, we don't know when he died, so we don't know when he died. And yeah, just, because that means first, he's just an orphan. He didn't just say that we don't know. Because the because claim was. An orphan, that he did and his not. His parents have. are unknown. You don't automatically say they have no beginning of days. That is nonsense. The, 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 let me finish because at the end, it links his role to the to the to the priesthood yeah, of but Jesus. You're, you're fast forwarding without answering the question. <laughs> Even if somebody has no mother or father, they will have an end, right? Hmm? Even if someone has someone you don't know their parents, they will still have an end, right? Yeah. Good. It says he has no beginning of days, no end of time. So once again, your response is incorrect. Okay. Okay. Let's say I don't know the response. What is the response? Then? You, you don't have a response because like I said, this criteria and these attributes can only fit almighty God, nobody else. Even Jesus has a mother. Je Jesus. And Jesus did have a beginning. Okay. And he had a apparent end on the cross as well, according to the Christians. So he's even so better what, than Jesus Christ, Malcolm. So what do we do? I wonder about why you guys don't worship him. Hmm? Okay, anyway, My look, look here. here. Here's the here's the bottom line. Does God the Father worship anyone? No. 
Did Jesus worship anyone? Yeah, he prayed to the Father, yeah. Good. Who is God then? Like, all that goes back to Jesus who was incarnated. Yeah, but even incarnate is fully God, right? It's, and he's also fully man. Yeah, That's so why fully he, man and fully God has a God. he got tired, he bled. Listen like, to this. The fully man and fully God has a God. Yeah, he's in his humanity. He has a God. He, he's like, always in his humanity after incarnation. That, did he say that he got sired? Did you say that he got sired? Yeah, begotten means sired. I didn't say sired. I don't even know that word. <laughs> okay. Term, man. You should, Sorry, you man. Use I thought you said sired. No, honestly, <laughs> as soon as you say that he's begotten, you're saying that he's sired. Sired means to have a child through reproduction, through natural reproduction. Okay. If God also has a son, he doesn't need to do it through reproduction. Yeah, but that's my what problem about this. <laughs> Because there's a reason there's a reason most of the new bibles they remove the term begotten ryan can i just tell you something bud i have a, a profound respect for you man you know why why because it's very intimidating to come in here and talk to to, to folks that are in this field when we have a, a very diverse and knowledgeable panel man so i congratulate you for coming up here and you know chatting this type of chat with us and we've been through this song and dance but i can tell that you're a little bit nervous which is understandable the reason why you're a little bit nervous is not only because we have numbers on you, okay, but because you're starting to critically think. And when you say that you've had these doubts for a very long time, the reason why you've had these doubts is because it's complete nonsense. You're standing upon nonsense, which the church told you to believe, but that very church that told you to believe this way still till this day has no answer other than it's a holy mystery. And this holy mystery has been progressively evolving since the first ecumenical councils. At first, it was just Jesus was divine and God, and God the Father was divine. Then they had a problem with the Holy Spirit. And then some years later, they said, we got to fix this problem. We got to throw the Holy Spirit in the mix. And they, they came out with the Athanasian Creed. Okay, but yet still till this day, it does not make any sense. So you guys are trying to make sense of nonsense. And this is the tangled web that keeps, you know, messing with your head. And all that all of us are trying to do here is to ask you a simple question. Is there a better way? Is there a better way to understand God, such as Tawheed, meaning the absolute oneness of God? Is there a better way to the path of forgiveness, meaning there's no need for a sacrifice, whether it be human or whatever you consider to be divine? Is there a better way to understand and live your life pragmatically? And we believe that to be Islam. This is, you're just touching the tip of the iceberg with the problems of Christianity, bro. And I think that by God's good grace, you're here on this panel because you you know that there's a problem, but we're not here to reinforce your we're not here to reinforce your negative train of thought, dude. All of us have gone through our experiences in life and have put the same question to the test that you're coming to. You are fighting your inner fitra, your inner inner guidance, your inner um, uh, sensical nature, like your inner nature that's saying God is just one, and that's why you're in this conundrum. You're in this you know, what seems to be like a washing machine. And we're telling you there is a better way. That better way is Islam. And I have a gut feeling that it makes perfect sense to you, but there's something that's preventing you from actually taking the appropriate step, whether it be your social sphere, your parents, this, that, and the third. So if I'm wrong in any way, just let me know. But the, the, this whole Trinity thing, dude, it's been beaten to death and you're going up against people that, you know, they have, mashallah, extreme knowledge, bro. Extreme knowledge. You're extremely outside of your depth. Any which angle that we take, and I mean this with all due respect, we will crush the concept of the Trinity. It's not worth it, dude. It just, it I doesn't mean, make any sense to tell me that some, that God took from his left pocket, paid his right pocket, doesn't make any sense to me that you're telling me that he went from divine to human divine, yet the creed says it's co-equal, which means that all the other persons need to have a human nature to them as well. Otherwise, they're not co-equal. 
It doesn't make sense to me that God supposedly died. It doesn't make sense to me that that's a requirement for him when he tells you in the Lord's prayer that we can he can forgive us in the same way that we forgive each other. You don't sacrifice your kid. I don't have to sacrifice my kid. We can just forgive our trespasses. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that God is praying to another God. It doesn't make sense that he's subordinate in any way. It doesn't make sense that there's two wills. We can just go on and on and on and on and on ex explaining how it doesn't make sense, or we can just accept that it doesn't make sense. So what I would like to say is you guys like maybe I'll have like a sure way, like to show that okay, this is logically a contradiction. Because it does because it is like God cannot logically contradict you because sure we may, maybe having two natures, you can kind of explain it away, but if you guys don't like a direct like logical contradiction, nice done. Okay. I'm willing to hear it. Okay, I have just you, gave have you had a chance logic. to read the Quran, Ryan? Yeah, okay. I've, I've been I've been taking the Quran slowly. It's a bit the word of reading is a bit it's a bit it's different to my usual book. It's kind of yeah, of course, book. it's different. Yeah, I'm we don't have the something. Trinity. I'm taking my time. I'm we don't have the book. original sin or the Trinity or forgiveness through the blood of an innocent mm -hmm. man. You know, Islam is very clear, very simple to the point. Uh, if you read even the Bible, you know. All the prophets and all the messengers, including Jesus Christ and his apostles and his disciples, they all worshipped the God of Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah, none of them worship a triune God. In fact, Jesus never advocated, nor did any of the prophets' messengers in the entire Bible taught anyone to worship a triune God. I mean... I mean, one of the reasons why I believe in the Trinity is because it's in the, the church, old Testament, it's because of the church, my friend. It's it's what you have been indoctrinated by the church, but it's certainly not from the Bible. Otherwise, the church wouldn't have taken three hundred years to establish this doctrine. I, I definitely agree with you with that at some point. Okay, good. So the Quran's message is very similar: worship one God, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Jesus the God of Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. And just like in the Bible, the Quran also says that when you have done, when you have committed a sin, when you have committed some wrong, seek repentance, seek true forgiveness from Almighty God. Yes, yeah, so if you look, read the book of Ezekiel 18, it says the father is not accountable for the sin of the son and the son is not accountable for the sin of the father. And then it goes on to say that even the wickedest of the wicked who have committed great sins, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, if they seek repentance from God and seek his forgiveness, then they will have eternal life. There is no mention of any belief in an innocent animal or innocent man who had to spill his blood in order to be forgiven. So this is the core message of the Quran as well, to seek forgiveness from God every time you, yeah. every time you fall. And even in the Old Testament, it says the alms, meaning giving, giving charity, forgive sins. Supplication, forgive sins. Good deeds, forgive sins. Anoint, uh, 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 is atonement for sins. Exactly what Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran. Exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says in the Ahadith. This is in your scriptures. You have got Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Hosea. All of these, all of these uh, um, prophets, you will find that they teach that supplication, charity, good deeds, all of this atone for for sins, not this, not the blood of an innocent man. The problem is that in the in the Old Testament, God admonished the practice of paganism which is human sacrifice i want to ask him what what logic are you looking for for what for which what? what logic are you looking for for the trinity to not make sense to you what i would say is like a how would i say it would be like a clear logical contradiction like for for example 
Sure, I'll give you one. Can humans lie, Ryan? Can humans lie, sure. Is that a yes or no? I need yeah, yes, yes, no? yes, 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 yes. Okay. Can God lie? No. Can Jesus lie? Jesus cannot lie. But was he fully human? Yeah. If he's fully human, then he must have the ability to lie, right? Because you told me humans can lie, right? You said yes to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's try it again. Can humans lie? Mm, yes. Can God lie? No. Can Jesus lie? Mm, no. <laughs> You're breaking your own not... logic, bro. Yeah, this yeah, is really, yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing the problem. I'm seeing the problem. Yes. And that's <laughs> a beautiful example. MashaAllah, brother. That's a beautiful example. I was gonna go in the direction of what's the composition of a human being? What makes a human being a human being? Mind, body, and soul, right? In a very simplistic way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Now, what's the composition of a divine being? Uh, you don't know. Like, how... Okay. So if you go down that route, he would need some type of a divine essence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So at what point do you know that Jesus was both a divine being and a human being? When every single time he did something, he said, I, by the power given to me from my father, he always attributed it to a divine source. He didn't he said, I of my own self can do nothing. And now here's what the church did. The, the church basically makes you think, oh, he can switch it on and off. So they're saying, have faith. It makes no logical sense, but have faith. And then I'm going to ask you, how do you know when he was switching it on and when he was switching it off? We can get to that. I do have to leave. I apologize. But I just have a final thought for Ryan. Yes, Ryan, please. In the Gospels, I think it's Matthew 23. Jesus tells the disciples that they have one teacher, the Messiah, meaning him. Okay. How many, how do you think, did do you believe Jesus taught the disciples to pray? Yeah. Do you believe it's important? Yes. Yeah. So how many prayers did he teach them? Mm. That was the only one. Only one, right? Yeah. And uh -huh. even though they differ in the different Gospels, it always begins with our Father in heaven. heaven. Right? It does not divert from that, right? Yeah, yeah. The thing is, the only time the Trinity comes into play is in some later manuscripts. They don't like how the prayer ended, and they have to add a doxology, and they add the words, at the end of it, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, that, I know the Right, so we know that's a later edition. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. In the main prayer, Jesus never thought another prayer, right? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. But after his crucifixion, when he was with the disciples, he appeared to them. Did he ever change the prayer? Mm, no, but the baptismal formula is kind of... <laughs> no, did he change the prayer? He didn't change the prayer. I already said not to that. Said... Okay. So at any point, did Jesus appear even to Paul and change that one prayer? Never. No. So here's the thing. If Jesus wanted us to worship the entire Trinity, why would he only teach us one prayer focused on God the Father and never address it to anyone else? I will say... I was just particular. There's a, there's a place in John where Jesus said to his disciples, "Ask everything you want in my name, so that the Father will be glorified." But he didn't the change the prayer. That is if you ask something to prayer. God, it's a prayer. No, 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 it isn't. Here's the thing: the prayer that Jesus teaches you is greater than any prayer you or I can imagine, because you believe He's divine, right? Yeah. Right. So Jesus said that he, the disciples, have only one teacher. Not you, not me, not John. One teacher, the Messiah, Matthew 23 10. So, did Jesus ever change that prayer, Ryan? No, that prayer, that prayer is cool. What I'm saying, Jesus no, said, they can ask things in his name, yeah, to the Father. but he didn't change the prayer, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, if he added in my name, wouldn't he have added it to that prayer? 
that prayer, that prayer is good. It's good as it is. Understand my question, why? If Jesus added that bit in my name, would he not have added it to the one prayer he taught them? Okay. First, I don't want to I be rude. I don't, I don't want to be rude. I don't think the line of argumentation goes very well here. Uh, because that's the one prayer they recorded. We don't know it's the only prayer he taught them. And just hold it to the, like, know it's the it's Father in his name. So I don't. Well, Ryan, here's the I problem, think, right? Here's the problem. If the triadic formula was added to that only prayer, it would have been added in the tradition within the first century. It wasn't. Yeah. The thing is, it's not coincidental that two of the gospel writers record the same prayer with no change. Mm -hmm. Right? So I'm saying to you, if he's the only teacher and he only ever thought them one prayer, such to the point it's called the Lord's Prayer, singled out in the entire christian tradition it shows one of two things either jesus was a bad teacher one two or the gospels are unreliable in what they claim of jesus and yeah. i can't believe in either of those two things i've got to wrap it up there I'm, I'm I'm sorry. The <laughs> that the gospels made an error maybe unreliable i'm, I'm kind of leading to that <laughs> well okay. i know that you believe they're unreliable one last point in Mark, in Mark chapter 3, in Mark chapter 3, and I want you to save this reference uh, if you can. It's Mark chapter 3, and it's verse 21. It reads, when, his, when the family of Jesus heard this, they went out to restrain him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Later in the same chapter, it tells us who the family of Jesus was who came to him. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came, standing outside, they sent word to summon him. The word used for out of his mind, it's disrespectful for Muslims to believe in this, but it's the word for out of his mind in Mark chapter 3 verse 21 is the word for crazy or insane. Do you understand this? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that Jesus' mother would ever refer to him as being crazy or insane. What? Well, take, 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 that it was his mother who said that he was out of his mind. Out of his mind, crazy. Mark chapter three, verse twenty-one. Mary, it's Mary that said that. Yeah. Mary, it lists her by name. Nah. I can't believe that. Watch this. Is there any Muslim on this panel that believes that Mary of Allah Islam? Would call her son Isa Allah crazy. I don't think Who anyone's is? mom will call no, their no, son no, crazy no. if he's not crazy. Now the thing is a prophet's yeah. mom. The thing is, Ryan, if you're Eastern Orthodox, you believe that Mary uh, she's pure of sin, right? So I mean, either she didn't lie, which would make Jesus crazy, or the Bible lied. I've got to go Khairan. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. And just to follow on, the next verse. 22 it says and the teachers of the law who came down from jerusalem said he is possessed by beelzebul by the prince of demons he's driving out demons so they consider him to be demon possessed that was his enemies i think <laughs> yeah the same enemies said that he is claiming to be god and then christians say yeah yeah we accept what they say so you have to be very consistent. The Christians need to be very consistent. If the accusations of the Jewish people is sufficient enough as an evidence, like the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, whoever they were, when they were accusing Christ of blasphemy, claiming to be God, and the Christians say, there you go, we have the evidence, because that's what they're saying. So the same people also say Jesus was demon-possessed. I think the criteria is which one does Jesus refuse and which one is just silent? Like for this. Let's understand one, one thing. When you have an opposition accusing mm -hmm. you or accusing someone, the accusation itself should not be counted as an evidence in any court of law. It needs to be established by evidence, right? So yeah, yeah. if someone says, oh, Ryan is blaspheming because he makes himself God. Now we can ask you, Ryan, did you make that claim or not? Isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. So what we find is, that Christians accepts the accusations of those factions of the Jews 
what they accuse Jesus of only when it comes to divinity but not when it comes to being demon possessed you just say that when they come Jesus was it Jesus for you just refuted them but when they call when him, he refuted them meaning what he, he disagrees said, with them that I am yeah. not God he refuted them for the demons but not I think I think that's the line of argument. no he refuted them for even being um from God like when they came and he says for what you know what have I done you know for what reason yeah, what, for I, what when he said uh, before uh, sorry he said uh, if you've seen work, me yeah. you've seen the father hmm. and this is when they picked up stones to throw at him the Jews and then Jesus asked them for what good works that I've done that you guys are stoning me and they responded it's not for the good works but you being a mere man are claiming to be God hence you're blaspheming so what did Jesus respond to them how did he no did how... not say ye are gods yeah. exactly who are gods I think it was in judges the judges this is in Psalm 82 verse 6 so when mm. Jesus says that all I'm saying is I'm God's son and they they knew the language in the Hebrew language God's son means a righteous being righteous person yeah so he said yeah. all I'm saying is I'm God's son and your 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 alleging blasphemy and stoning me for that so he defended he could have said yes you're right i'm claiming to be god but he didn't say that that was a perfect opportunity for him to say that yeah, yeah that's true just so, remember so the whole fundamental principle the whole fundamental principle of isa Islam, or jesus christ as, as you know him is is god is never extensively covered in the bible period like it's not easily and demonstrably unambiguously unequivocally just the, the most important pillar of your faith which leads to your atonement which leads to salvation and everything else is just completely disregarded ryan ryan listen to what jesus says himself and this is i don't know if you've got the bible at hand and this is John 5 37 the father who sent me has himself borne witness about me his voice you have never heard his form you have never seen so what does this verse tell you about Jesus that he has heard the voice of God no that, that the father has sent him he is that he is a subordinate you know when before you were saying that he is god and that he is not god and he is saying like who has because before you said he who has seen the father has seen me mm -hmm. and in here jesus is saying that his voice you have never heard his form you have never seen and that's include jesus because jesus is as you said fully human fully divine do you understand the point uh, the point i'm getting yeah, that, at Ryan. that he's been yeah that's his that's his, like a subordinate to the father and yes why, because man, like, you're a muslim dude you're just you're you're just fighting yourself for some unknown reason i just okay. i see it in you man like i see it in your body language and everything let, let, me, ask him, Maurice, let yeah. me ask him this question let okay. me ask him this question Mm -hmm. Do you believe do you believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? No. <laughs> what no, no, you say believe? I believe it existed. I'm not sitting no Ryan Ryan I'm not sitting a trap for you but there are lots of Christians that believe in Muhammad peace be upon him. So that's I, I why I'm asking you the I, question. I believe but, it existed. But yeah not... this is what I mean this is what I mean yeah. lots of Christians believe in Muhammad peace be upon him. Why why so would you reject you, him? What's your criteria? Hmm? For accept what's your criteria for accepting or rejecting a prophet? Uh, what I think the most sure way is to it should be sure that he's he aligns with the previous revelations. Because um, let me be, be, be a bit vulnerable because I've kind of considered Islam for some time, but the corruption narrative is a bit weird and before go, before I read, before going to all of that, let's say Christianity is false. Why would not I be a Jew? Why would I not decide maybe to convert to Judaism? 
or I don't know why should I go specifically to Islam? Does, does yeah. Judaism accept Jesus Christ? No, they don't. But exactly, <laughs> they reject Jesus Christ <laughs> even as a prophet, let alone as as one of the Trinity. We'll take it step by step. It's a fair question of what you're asking. Which, I preach the I only really religion the other than Christianity, which accepts and acknowledges Jesus as a Christ, as a Messiah. And, and by the way, remember your own criteria. You said that you, you're curious about the corruption, right? But you know of the biblical corruption. So all that we, we have to take it step by step in order for us to fill a hole. There has to be something to fill. If your cup is full right now, then there's nothing. There's no room for anything else. So the first thing that we've done is we've established that Christianity cannot be true from a standpoint and from a logical standpoint. You agree so far, right? No, there was there was noise near me. I didn't know. Okay, so we've established so far that from a scriptural standpoint and from a logical standpoint, the Christian understanding and the Christian faith, it it, it is completely false. Do you agree to that, right? I can't just say that now. You got. I Why not? <laughs> Why not? Just be, to thy own self be true, bro. Be honest with yourself. No, you know, if you if you're not being sincere and you're not being honest with yourself, we can't pave the way for progress. You know, it's it, it, that's the whole point of these conversations. And Alhamdulillah, you and everybody else, along with the panel and the people that are that are listening, th this is a subject that's very important to them, and. It's not just they see it, you see it, we see it, but you're the only one that's not acknowledging it. So, like, just to thy own self be true, bro. It's This is the difference. It isn't about, like, just being proven right or wrong. This is, like, your eternity in question, man. And that's yeah. why you're interested in the subject because you yeah. know the gravity of the situation. So yeah, so I, can, I cannot just say on a whim that it is false. Like, I need to really sit down, meditate, pray to guide me before, like, I kind of spit on the panel after discussing. Okay, so can that's fine. Discuss. You can, I, I, I encourage that, man. I definitely encourage it. However, are you satisfied with our reasoning of yeah, why, yeah. Uh, let me let me phrase it in a very gentle way. Are you satisfied with our reasoning why we believe it's false? Definitely, definitely. I can... Right. So let, let, let that kind of thought sink in, okay? Now, going forward, it's still our responsibility to give you reasoning why we believe Islam is true. Right? Okay. It's only fair. You have to put it up to a, a comparison. So now Brother Hashem asked you, you know, what's your criteria for, for establishing a prophet? Now you had said, oh, well, there has to be evidence in the previous scriptures. But understand that it's not fair for you to say that when we believe that the previous scriptures are corrupted. So there, there must be something else that, that we can use to show you evidence of prophethood. If your condition is that it must align with the Christian scriptures, then... Not with the Christian, even just with the Jews. No, I don't care. Not, not, even, I think they got, not even just with the Christian. I don't care if it even contradicts it. So even, even if they reject Jesus, you're okay with that, yeah? I, I, because they, they think that they, 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 they wish I know Jesus is through the gospel. No, no, but you said even if they're even if it's the Jewish criteria, you're okay with that. So no, you're okay right. to reject you Jesus the Christ. the scripture of the Jews, right? Seriously, man, just listen. I, to I mean, the scripture of the Jews. I don't mean the Jews themselves. Where did, how do you think that Judaism they interpret their scripture based on Christianity? No, I, that's what I say. You can prove that maybe the interpretation is wrong. No, no, hold like, on. You mentioned Judaism. When you say Jews, you probably mean Judaism. Yeah? I just refer to the scriptures. I don't really care about what. No, but the mean. scripture, the Old Testament, yeah. I think, it was given I, I to the Jews, what, right? What, what Moses is, brought Ryan, it to the Jews. He didn't what bring Ryan it to the is trying to say, Hashim, I think, is look. Yeah. So he understands that, okay, fine, there's a lot of um, issues with the Christian theology and understanding of God and so on. So he's saying, okay, fine, but at least, at least it needs to be in line with the previous scripture of the Jewish people because Christianity came actually from them in, in a way. So he's going to, as far as I understand, Ryan, that you're going back to the roots where Christians got this idea from. So yeah. at least within the Jewish context, about God and about prophets, that should make sense. That's what you're saying. Yeah. But what yeah, Brother yeah. Lewis and Hashim and yeah. everyone else is saying here, yeah, look, if we are not even sure about this scriptural preservation of the Jews themselves, then of course you cannot make that into a yardstick or a gold standard to compare with. If you want to compare Islam 
and to say, okay, let's see whether Islam aligns with, whether it matches with the previous scripture of the Jewish people. But if the Jewish scripture itself is questionable, whether they have the preserved scripture or not, then it will be difficult for you to compare with because what are you comparing with? It's not a standard you're comparing with. If I say, for example, you know what, this weighs one kilo, I need to know what a one kilo is. And that one kilo has to be doubt free. If my one kilo weight is doubtful, like, is it one kilo? Is it 950 grams? Is it 973 grams? Then how are you going to compare this to be comparable to one kilo or not? So the Let standard that you're going to compare with has to be quite sure. So, Let I'm going to throw you a bone, right? Yeah. From the Islamic perspective, Ryan, there's no such thing as Judaism or Christianity. It never existed. It's man-made. It, it, it was always somebody was a Muslim or not. That's it. So when we talk, talk about previous prophets like Abraham, David, Moses, uh, Jesus, peace be upon all of them, these, these all these prophets were Muslim. We don't say that Abraham was a Jew and there was, you know, or, or you know, it just, we don't do that. So from the Quran, the Quran tells us that the only religion accepted in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Uh, what is Islam? It is submission to the one deity worthy of worship. So we believe that Adam submitted. We believe that Moses, Solomon, Abraham, Jesus, Noah, they all submitted. And we believe that their at their time, they had specific rules. It was the Islam of their time. The Islam of your time is the rules set forth by the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the, we, we are, back then, they, there was no such thing as an Abrahamic Jew. It was an Abrahamic Muslim. There was no such thing as, as, a, as a Jesus Christian. It was a Jesus Muslim. Do you understand? So... Ryan, do you believe that uh, do you believe that Jesus is a prophet? Now, if do you believe down, that uh, Isa? Uh, yeah, do you believe that Isa, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? Do you believe? Uh, do you believe he is a prophet? So, now down this way, this is the conundrum that I am. But the only one know Jesus is really through the Gospels. But if you cannot really okay. trust the Gospels, okay. How about how about if I show you? How about if I show you from the gospel that Jesus is a prophet? But the gospels are not trustworthy. Like, I'm, that's, that's why I'm confused, you see. I'm trying like, to progress the discussion. Right. And I appreciate that. And I, I think all of us can recognize that. So here's what we're trying to say. We're trying to say, if your worldview is that you believe that the gospels, I'm not saying this is the case, right? So, and by the way, remember the question that I asked you previously, if you're a Christian, you're, you're, you're out of the fold of Christianity by saying what you just said. So you passively just kind of left Christianity right there. Alhamdulillah. So we're making fun of it. But here's the deal. And because it's the truth, it's the, the truth will perish falsehood, bro. It's so simple. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, makes it so easy, right? It's just the devil doing his thing, but he sucks at it. So that's why he's, he's destined for eternity of fire. Okay. So here's the deal. If we stick to your worldview of recognizing value in the Bible, we're happy to show you the prophethood of, of Isa al -Islam. But if you agree that they're not reliable, then it won't do us any good, man. It won't do it. We can show you a thousand places where in the Bible he's considered a prophet. You can find it in the book of John. You can find it all over the place. Mark, right? Luke. A a everywhere. So what we want to know is as we kind of keep going on this journey with you is, is there another way? Is there, is there a logical way that we can test that prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was in fact a prophet? Is there something that we can, that we can show you or a way that we can explain to you to add validity to his prophethood? If we, we can't look at the previous scriptures anymore because you already agree that there's corruption in them and we can't use them as a yardstick from our worldview because we also believe that there's corruption and we believe that all of them were Muslim. So now we, in, we, we can show you logically, if you want, that he is indeed a prophet. Do you want to explore that? I'm all ears. 
Okay, great. Uh, one of the other brothers, if you, I've been, I have been talking a lot. That's I fine, talking. Been, but you're, you're talking sense. So, <laughs> so brother, um, Maurice, uh, as I still want to know his criteria for recognizing. It, yeah, it's okay. We will, we can, we can establish that. Yeah. Ryan, in terms of accepting anyone to be a prophet of God, there are a few essential conditions needs to be met, right? So you need to establish that this person is being truthful. Yeah. yeah. So being truthful automatically eliminates someone being an imposter, someone being pretender, someone being a fake, because they are going to be dishonest. So the truthfulness or the honesty part is very paramount, very important to establish, because if someone is known to be truthful all their lives, then it is questionable to say, oh, he just lied here about this. OK. okay. And if you find about Prophet Muhammad Islam, historical information about him, you will be surprised that even his enemies testified that he was a truthful person. So he grew up in a community in which people never accused him of being untruthful. They even gave him a title, a Sadiq al-Amin, the truthful one, the trustworthy one, the reliable one. So they, they, they made sure that this is among the community that he is known like that because of his character. So for the full 40 years of his life, they've known him to be such of an upright character. This is historical information that's come down to us. So when he received revelation from God, of course, it's not something that he made himself. God gave him and appointed him as a prophet to give a message. He came to his people. And the way at that time, the, the Arab custom was such that if it's something important to say, you would go and climb the mount, some of these hills of Mecca, for example, and you call the people, Ya Sabaha, the various ways of calling. So that people know that something important, you know, like um, early Christians had church bells. They would ring the bell and everyone will leave their homes, their work, their study, whatever, and then just go to that place. Something important is happening. OK, there's a threat for the community or whatever. So Arabs had something like this. So then Prophet Islam called like this. They came. And said, what's going on? Because, you know, is there an imminent, imminent danger or not? And he said, I'm paraphrasing the whole event, make it easier for you to understand. What if I told you there's an army waiting to attack you behind the mountains? Would you believe me? Do you know what they said? They said of course we would. We've never known you to lie. We've never known you to lie. So he made sure he test they, they testified about his truthfulness. And of course, when he said, okay, yes, God has made me a prophet and so on. Then they started questioning him like, oh, no, that cannot be right. Because their, their desires, their privileges were now going to be questions. Because when he says, no, there's no God worthy of worship except one and only God. And they have so many of them. And it's actually a trade and a business and economic boom and everything. And everything's now going to be totally gone out of business because he's saying there's only one God and none of them are gods. So they have a problem. And that's why they started now being um, opposing him, being an enemy of him and saying, no, we're not going to accept this call. Right. So they, they knew and they testified of his truthfulness and uh, his trustworthiness. Now, if for the sake of argument, if he was going to be someone who is a pretender, for example, let's critically analyze it. This is called critical analysis. Someone doesn't just simply say, say I'm a prophet of God for no reason. Either someone is totally out of their mind, a majnoon, a crazy person, insane. That's why they're saying this, they don't even know what they're saying. That's one possibility. Or someone is actually not insane and crazy, fully conscious, and yet being dishonest and being an imposter, they're making this dishonest claim. If they're making this dishonest claim, then they must have a motive, a reason. They can't just simply claim prophethood for no reason. You have to establish a motive for it. So let's deal with the insanity bit. If he was really insane, crazy, and he's making this claim, people can excuse him saying he's insane, he's, he's crazy, that's what he's saying. But is he someone 
who can be established to be insane and crazy out of, the, out of his mind because his speech is eloquent. His reasoning is praiseworthy, acceptable. What he brings to the Quran is the most eloquent book the Arabs ever knew. The examples the Quran provides, the, the teachings and the guidance, the laws, the regulations. This is not a product of a crazy individual. So it cannot his, be his character. Yeah. So it cannot be that he's a crazy individual claiming to be from God, a, a prophet of God. So that we have we can eliminate. So that means okay, fine. He's quite conscious of it himself, and he is maybe he's trying to claim prophethood for a reason. Okay. What could be the reasons? Let's go by possible reasons. And if we eliminate that, there's no reasons he's left, and we exhaust all of them. The only thing remaining is he's truthful. Does it make sense? If we can eliminate and exhaust all of these motives that one can have to make a claim, then the only thing that left is he's a sincere person in his claim. So he's being truthful. And if that backs up with evidence, this is the big part we're going to talk about, then of course we have no reason not to accept him as a prophet. All the reasons to accept him as a prophet of God. Okay. Motive number one. Okay. Maybe he is a reformer. A socialist reformer he wants to reform the society because there's so many things going on some people uprise themselves right they stand against the, uh, among the crowd and they want to uh, reform the society because there's so much evil going on there for example could he be one of them he was trying to reform so if he's trying to reform what is trying to reform from what let's try to understand what is trying to reform is he trying to reform and saying, oh, you people, look, you are the worst of the people. And we need to understand what he's trying to reform. Think about ministry. These people were worshipping many gods. If he wants to reform the people, what's the best way of doing it? Uniting them or disuniting them? Uniting them. Because when there is disunity and division, you can't make a change happening. If it's a tribal society, and a tribal leader, whatever he says, that this happens. When the tribal leader decides, yep, this is it, everyone follows. So if you now have several tribes and they're all disunited and divided, you cannot make any good change of whatever change you want to make. So what he comes up with, he's saying with what? None of these gods are worthy of worship. He's totally gone against the tribe. He's totally disunited them. He's made them so divisive. In fact, they were collaborating against him in their collaboration against him so it's not something that he could unite them he made it even more divisive so that is not something that worked here if that was one of the reasons couldn't that uh, mean that maybe it's more of a revolutionary type like once a revolution no. but his revolutionary ideas were not going to be acceptable because he is not uniting anyone to accept his message He's in, he's, he's in direct opposition as to what's going on. So like, yeah. remember, it's heavy pagan times. They're burying their young. They're, there's a lot of drunkenness, gambling. It like, goes into against the old customs. Everything was completely just strange. Yeah. So instead of saying, okay, fine, you know what? Let's have a common agreement. Okay, you're good and he's good and they're good. Let's meet halfway kind of thing. And he just comes in there and says, yeah, all this needs to stop. So they were only pagans. So how do he even get the idea of one god? Yeah, that's a great question. Good question. So <laughs> there has always been people between messengers to messengers in a state, some people who are already inclined towards worship of one god. So he did not follow any of those paganistic traditions of worshiping the idols and so on and so forth, but he would himself reject all of this worship. At the, around the age of 40, he would go into a seclusion because, remember, he was a person who would attend to sheep and so on and so forth, um, like grazing animals. And that really is a preparation for the prophethood to be from God because God is making him look at the stars and gaze at the sky at night and saying, how can all of this be? by these stone gods that they themselves have carved, that this is created by these gods, they made out of date stones, of wood, and so on and so forth. So at one point he went 
into seclusion in some of the one of the mountains in Kaaba to meditate about this world. What's you know, who is this creator? Who is this who must have created all of these things? So this oneness of God is already implanted, already in the, the natural disposition. But to know more about is this because the gods of the pagans cannot be the gods of, of reality. Yeah. So he already knew about this one God, and there are a few people likewise called the Hanif who are already inclined to the uh, acknowledgement of worship of one God. So when he came to these people, if he was a fake individual imposter, he would have tried to unite them, but he made them disunited in, in terms of the things that he brought. So that could not be a motive. Okay, maybe his motive is, you know what, he liked to be the leader. He wanted leadership. Maybe he wanted kingship. He wanted to be king. Maybe he wanted power. Maybe he wanted authority. Maybe he wanted money. Maybe he wanted wealth, status. Yeah, people have this kind of motives. But guess what? He was already from a noble family, already from a tribe, <coughs> excuse me, who was, who were known to be the elites. <coughs> One second. It's like I'm having <coughs> speakers call now. Grab the I'll come back. You can take Yeah, Bismillah. So uh, uh, he had nobility, and you got to take a look, right? Like, what's the what's the end goal? As a matter of fact, they offered him power. They offered him status. And he told them that, by God, if you were to put the moon in my left hand and the sun in my right hand, on, this is according to one narration, that I, I won't stop. And understand that the what was going on, um, the the type of social structure that was happening here. Th these are very heavy familial tribal people. So they're they're basically saying not only are you insulting yourself, you're insulting your entire lineage. So even the people that were closest to him were being jeopardized in some way, shape, or form. Right. Let me continue, Brother Maurice, and then you come in, inshallah. Yeah. So if he was his, you know, motive of wealth and status and fame and power and glory and kingship and so on, he was already from a noble family. So the nobility is not something that he needs to seek. Now he's already noble. You know, in a tribal society, if you're noble, that's it. You know, people will listen to you. In fact, at one point when they were disputing between the tribes after a refurbishment of the Kaaba to put back this stone, the black stone, onto the Kaaba. Okay. Now they're saying between themselves, fighting between themselves in words like, who's going to put it? They're quarreling and they're, they're undecided. Like now, imagine they fight over one camel for 40 years. That's right. We are talking about this kind of the division and, and dispute people have and goes on for generations. Now, potentially, there's going to be a huge dispute again in terms of who's going to place the stone on, back on the Kaaba. So they said, you know what? We can't solve it. The only way we can it. Next morning, whoever comes first in the vicinity, we'll let that person decide. And guess what? It was Rasulullah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they were all happy that now they know that, okay, we don't have to fight anymore. And then he came and says, you know what? You know, put a piece of cloth in there, put it on, on, on the piece of cloth, and then they would hold the corners of this cloth, and then all of them will take it and place it on Kaaba. So he diplomatically arranged it. So he's already known to them like how he's going to be. Brother Mansoor, if I can, I just want to reinforce the gravity of this situation. These people are ready to chop each other up. They were literally about ready to cut each other's heads off. Like that's how serious this was, okay? And this further lends, lends credence to the character of who Muhammad uh, was, in, was. So not only did he understand the gravity of the situation, but the way that his judgment was and how quickly he came to a conclusion. It's not like, imagine somebody was like, oh, I'd have to sleep on it. Let's give it another day, this, that, and the third. No, his judgment was sound right away, okay? So as Brother Mansur is kind of going on, I want to stress like certain elements because they can be very easily kind of glanced over. 
So remember to the initial thing, the initial question, logically speaking, was this man like insane or was he unsound or something like that, right? You can clearly see that these are, if somebody was, was permitted to function as a major tribal arbiter, right? Then these people clearly thought that this person was capable of doing this type of arbitrage. So he functioned as a judge in a situation that prevented major bloodshed, like all out, yeah, right, yeah. Okay. So, so it's not about nobility and and in terms of acceptance he's seeking for. Is he already has that? What about fame and glory and money and kingship? In fact, we know from history they actually approached him at one point, saying, "You know what? Look, if you want to be the king, we will make you the king," because they were really, really fed up if, if, if I want to use this word because he's calling people to abandon the worship of the idols don't worship Allah al -Uzza, al -Manat, all of the idols that you know they're worshiping abandon the worship of all of these things and return to the worship of one God who created everything and because it is totally jeopardizing destroying their whole economy because it's a business in Hajj pilgrimage people will come and they will bring wealth and money and resources and so on and now he's destroying all of that saying none of these are to be worshipped so they're trying all their best to find ways and means to stop him they could not just simply at initial stage to you know assassinate him if you want to use this word because he is from a very powerful very noble family as well okay so they can't do that but at, at later in one point later in history they did try to attempt to do this but that's a later stage we can come to. So initially then, so when he was calling people, they said, we will make you the king if you want to be the king. If you really desire kingship, we will make you the king. If you want money and wealth, we will give you all this money and wealth. Or if you want women, if that's what you're after, just name them. We will give you the women that you want. So they're ready to make him the leader, the king, give him the honor, the glory, the power, the status, the fame, the women, the wealth. If he was an imposter, someone who was doing this claim of prophethood for this motive, that's his golden chance to accept it because he's actually now got it. What did he say? We have historical report on one point in situation like this, when they asked him about this, he says, look, if you gave me the sun on one hand and the moon on the other hand, I would never stop from this call of calling you to worship none but God. So he didn't accept any of their offerings, offers that they gave to make him a king because it wasn't his motive. So we know that this political motive, this uh, social motive, this physical motive, economic motive, none of this is something that is going in line with history because he could have he would have accepted all of that in terms of maybe he wanted to unite the arab tribes as we said then why is he saying maryam -salam was the best of all the women a jewish woman how is that uniting the arabs when he's saying no it's not your woman who's the best it's a jewish woman the mother of christ she is the best of all the nisa al alameen well of, of the world so as you can see, the idea that he's trying to unite the Arabs as well doesn't make sense. So what are we left with? No political motive, economic motive, social motive of fame, status, glory, kingship, money, women, wealth. We are exhausting all possible motives. Now, on top of that, what did he bring? He brought the Quran, a fake individual, a fake an imposter, if he was going to say, look, oh, there you go, God has revealed to me this, so that people, you know, trying to make people believe, right, by his um, fake revelations. Now, would he just go in and tell people, ask me anything, I will answer. Even presidents and prime ministers and kings in this world, when they go to conferences and something like that, they don't say that. They have a pre-written script and answer they've memorized, mostly, okay? Because what if now somebody asks you about, a, a say a ruler, a prime minister, or someone you know, a head of the state goes there, and someone asks you about, tell me about your climate change. 
he's going to get stuck. He's going to get really busted. Because why? Because this per the country is all against the climate change policies and so on and so forth. So they don't allow people for open questions like that. But the Quran encouraged like this. And this is what the Prophet said. Ask anything. When the Quran is being revealed, the answer will be given to you. So this confidence comes from where? An imposter will never have this confidence. Okay? Think about one by one the examples I'm giving. So when, for example, he brings, he brings issues of ancient history and he says, you did not know this before. Hey, look, an imposter, how can he? He's only 40 years old and there are people older than him who travel around the peninsula and so on and so forth. And he is saying, telling them, you did not know this before. And they knew that he was not someone who's learned, someone who went to a, a school or any kind of institution of learning within their If I could say, you have an example? Yeah. Of... Uh, I, I will, I will. So, yeah. at least you understand the gravity. I understand he, that, yeah. Yeah. So, when he said, there's many examples from the Quran, maybe Sheikh can remind us, and the Quran says, you did not know this before. Like issues of Maryam Islam, when Zakaria was in charge of her and what happened when there was this drawing the lots with the arrows you're muted Sheikh. you muted 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 i can't hear you yeah Translate. yeah you were not with them when they were disputing between themselves and when uh, how does the ayah go again you were not them? with them when they threw their pans into the into the canal and you were when, not with them when they were arguing amongst themselves who who's gonna uh, uh, foster uh, mary uh, mary yeah so various examples the quran says it says you did not know this before now so no one means, yeah you did not know this before these are the knowledge of the unseen they could have simply come and said but I knew it, and that would be over. A few more examples. How does he have the confidence to say, like, you know what? This person called Abu Lahab, this is a nickname, okay? Him and his wife will enter hellfire, and there will be this, you know, palms of the five and so on. They will be the fuels of the hellfire, okay? So they will be in the hellfire. This individual... Could have simply come and said ah you're saying i'm going to go to hell i'm never i'll never be muslim i declare that you are the messenger of god and there's none worthy of worship except god he would have declared islam and he would have made islam false because once you declare yourself then you enter islam you know you don't go to hellfire this individual lived for more than 10 years after this proclamation of the quran he's one of the chapter of the quran okay towards the end surah Al Masad, it talks about like this that this will, this is the one way destination of this individual, no coming back because God knows who, whose heart is already like this and will never turn back. So, God gave the information of the future. So, this individual could have, even as a hypocrite, said, Okay, I'm a Muslim, but had 10 years of opportunity. So, how does the Prophet, as an imposter, if he was an imposter, have that confidence to say this individual will never even declare? Never did. When the Quran talks about the people of the uh, scripture, the Ahl al Kitab, the Jewish people, and says, Look, you, uh, you will never long for death. You will never long for death. You don't want never want to die. Isn't that how the ayah goes, Sheikh? Yeah. No, the, the best the, the best uh, is is Surat al Kahf. Surat al Kahf, when they ask him the questions. No, you can go there, but let's give you this example that the, the Jewish people, you never long for death, isn't it? This is an ayah, something around this time. Now, they could have just simply said, yeah, I, uh, we can die because these people didn't want to die in such that. How does the Prophet know the inner psychology of an individual like that? So I'm dealing with. He's dealing with interacting with people who have free will. And with their free will, they could have totally dismantled his claims of prophethood and Islam being true. Because they had the free will to do so. They had the knowledge and free will. 
but he's totally somehow eliminated that they can't say that. This is called total incap incapacitation. Total incap in incapacitation, like decapacitated or incapacitated, I don't know the English word here now. Totally getting from them like they would not be able to do that. In the examples of um, Surah al Rum, he says, look, the Romans have been defeated, but within three to nine years, they will be victorious again. Why would someone, when there's two major superpowers of the day, the Persians and the Byzantines, yeah, fighting among each other in a several years of fighting, he's saying, look, they will regain victory again within this time period. He's risking his prophethood because if that didn't come true, like recently we spoke to someone who claimed that someone in Pakistan has become a Mahdi and all the signs has come true, that means the world's going to come to an end very soon. And I said, for how soon? He says, like 200 years. I said, look, good. Record that conversation for posterity. 200 years later, when the world is still here, then they would know that he was an imposter. And two things I just want to add, Brother Mansur, mashallah. The first thing, bro, is in regards to the revelation of Surah Mesed, right? The guy could have, he had all that time, like Brother Mansur said, 10 years. He could have even faked it. He could have been, become a hypocrite, but he didn't. Right? He, he, he passed away like a, a full-blown disbeliever. Okay, So that's the first thing. The second thing is understand that the Quran was revealed over the course of 23 years in fragments. And this was done through events and conversations that took place both with his companions and his enemies of the Prophet. So, and, and now it was structured in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony. If you've never had a chance to actually listen to the Quran, and ask yourself this, ask yourself, what are the chances of an illiterate man in the middle of the Arabian desert bringing not only the most sophisticated thing known to man as far as linguistics, but laws, like full-blown laws on how to conduct ourselves, what to do in case of, of like divorce, inheritance, uh, you name it, like cr criminal activity, uh, establishing treaties, like what are the chances? Either this guy secretly had like 20 PhDs in multiple languages, understood everybody's psychology, everybody's culture, or, <laughs> or yeah, right? Or he is getting his information from somewhere else beyond. Like I'm not talking about like talking to, you know, John or whatever, but actually getting his information from somewhere else. And that was, th this is what we're, we're saying. We're saying that there is, there is no way that he could be in communication with anything else but a divine entity, right? And it, re remember, 23 years, completely fragmented. And then he knew exactly where to piece what. Okay, that's crazy. That, it's crazy, man. It's, it's absolutely crazy, right? So... So this is Islam. This is what we are inviting you to. And, and by the way, here's the best part. The best part is it was all 100% preserved. No errors, no contradictions, nothing. Like, and we have chains of narration, something that you, that, that, that the Christians and Jews and stuff, they just don't have it. It wasn't part of, of, of their, the, the, the structure of their corpus. It just wasn't. So, so not only are we just telling you things. Oh, sorry. Not, my, not only that. Not only that. Uh, not only that. But if we were to burn all of the Qurans today, all of them, all of them, the Quran, Allah Jalla wa Ala says about it that He will preserve it, and it is preserved in the chest of the believers. So, if all the Qurans were to be destroyed today. On the same day, we will write another one similar to it, letter for letter, word for word. Right. And here's the, the, the biggest thing. None of what it says in the Quran will ever disagree with your fitrah, with your natural inclination. It will not be in opposition in any way because God creates a fair test. So if, for example, the Quran says that Allah or Almighty God is one, there's no, there's no need to explore this whole three and one and why stop at three and go to four and what blah, 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 blah. And all 
No, it doesn't go with your natural inclination to be talking about threes and fours. And then, you know, you have like the Hindus that are that, are, that are believe in like thousands of, of deities or representation of deities and all this stuff. Right. So point being is that we have the capabilities of sitting here and talking to you about this stuff for hours, hours. Yeah. But we don't want you to take our word for it because the very Quran that we believe in tells you present your proofs, go do your, do your due diligence. Don't just trust what your forefathers are saying, go and do research. But here's the, here's the criteria. The criteria is that when you see it, when it clicks, okay, you submit because if you don't, you're just being insincere. And remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it's a, when, when he's sealing people's hearts, it's a consequence of their actions. The consequence is their disbelief or the consequence is their arrogance or the consequence is their, and it's always attributed to a negative thing. So I can tell that you're a very sincere guy and you're interested in the truth. And what I can tell you from, from being a Muslim for close to, you know, alhamdulillah going on 13 years now, bro, is every single time that we deal with people's doubts or every single time that I myself have a question about Islam, or, or just a, a life in general question, every single time, and no joke, Islam has provided a solution. And it wasn't just like, a, oh, just believe in it. No, it was something that was pragmatic, that was applicable, that was comprehensible, that was not illogical. It, everything was, was, you know, now there's, a, there's gonna be a degree of difficulty. So like, for example, when you, be, when you accept Islam, it's very simple. You just attest that there's only one deity worthy of worship and you're there. Meaning you right now believe in that there's only one deity worthy of worship. The second part of the attestation is that you believe that the Prophet Muhammad a. is a messenger of this deity. Okay. This is it. That's the, that's the only criteria to enter Islam. Now, the things that I said that are difficult, for example, you have ritualistic practices, which are commandments. So why do we pray five times a day and, and, and not, it's not commanded to do mandatory six or seven or eight, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us through his prophet والسلام, and through the Quran that it's five times and that's what we, that's, we hear and we obey, right? So these rituals that come with Islam, there's a degree of difficulty to them, man, because now you're going to be adjusting your entire lifestyle. There's going to be a degree of difficulty of eating halal only. There's going to be a, de a degree of difficulty of treating your parents in the manner that Islam tells you to treat them, even if they're disbelievers. Right. There's a degree of difficulty in biting your tongue. But all of that comes second to you first acknowledging that there's only one deity worthy of worship and that the Prophet is his messenger. Nice. And, and this is the beauty of Islam. Because it was revealed over the course of 23 years, you see that there is an easement, meaning that you're going to it's going to take time to understand. Now, why do we encourage you to actually take your Shahada and make this testimony as soon as possible? We're not doomsday type guys, and me particularly, I'm not. I don't like to go off of a concept of fear. I actually love the concept of hope and love in Islam, but I have to balance that and be real. The reality is, is I don't know if after this conversation, if I'm ever going to see you again. I just, I just don't know it, right? I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow. Let, never mind you. I hope that you live a very long life, right? Now, that being said, you also don't know either. I would rather take the guarantee of beginning my studies, but genuinely acknowledging where I'm at today, meaning that you believe in that one deity worthy of worship, and hopefully the evidences that we presented to you is enough to accept Muhammad Islam as at least not an average guy, that he is talking to some sort of divine being. Yeah. Meaning he is indeed, there's, a, there's an essence of prophethood to him. If you, believe, yeah, if you believe these two things, accept it and then begin your research. And I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that you won't leave the fold of Islam unless it's for an emotional reason. There you is know, never a logical reason for somebody to leave Islam, ever. You know, you know why I asked you before if you believe that uh, Isa, peace be upon him, is a prophet in according to the Bible? Because there are some verses, and now you said you don't, you don't believe it or did you have doubts regarding it but within the bible there are it like for example in matthew Ju, uh, john mark and luke all of them 
in the times where he was called the prophet because he performed miracles or he did things that showed the characteristics of a prophet, of someone who is, he has got the contact with, 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 with Allah, with the, with the supreme being, with, with the creator. So now, after what Brother Mansour has told you, and Brother Morris has told you, there is nothing more I can add. So what's your take on this? I will have to go and do my research because it sounds too good to be true and I have bad experiences with Which things. part? Which part? Which it sounds too good, good. Too it sounds good, good to be true. Which yeah, part? That, no, no, he what? doesn't say it's not true. He's saying, okay, this seems to be like, okay, how can all of this make sense? I mean, there must yes, be Yes, yes, that's what, that's what I'm asking that's him. Why, that, that's why I think a, a few more things I want to, because if, you, if you're not ready to, uh, you, know, you know, enter the fold of Islam right now, no one's going to force you to do so, as long as you make that step. But what I was trying to finalize in the critical analysis of the, the position of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu his prophethood. So we said his motives is something that we cannot establish anything like that. And then we went to what he brought. What he brought talks about science, history, anthropology, botany, it, every avenue of science. An imposter cannot do that, let alone any knowledgeable person, even from his time, or even a group of people together, they cannot make something like this Quran. When the Quran describes and says, look, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقُنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth was joined together as one piece and God parted it asunder. And he brought every living thing from water. Would they then not believe? Look, someone in the desert asking people to think and reflect on the creations of the heavens and the earth, the stars, the galaxies and the earth, that at one point it was all joined together as a singularity, one piece. And there was separation. And then not only that, as if like astrophysics wasn't enough, in the same verse, is talking about biology, that every yeah. living thing is from water. Yeah, yeah. Got, and it ends with saying, would they then not believe? Addressing people's doubts, giving proof and evidence, and then rhetorically ask, what's stopping you from believing it? This is just one example of so many of the Quran information it gives from the natural sciences that you do not expect someone to have known this 1400 years ago, let alone any imposter or any people around that time. Many, many examples can be given in terms of how Quran brings this natural sciences to people's reflection, which people could not have known back then. You need a microscope, you need a telescope, you need all these resources and tools. So if this is indeed the level of information and the resources that you need for that information, it tells you this person is not getting this information from his own self. He's not getting this information from his locality, the people around him. He's not getting information from other people, from other cultures, because they don't even have that concept. It's something unique, something new, something novel, something that's amazing. So when he brings information like this, and he says, this is not from me, this is a revelation from God. Some people might say, oh, you know what? Maybe Satan did it. I've heard people saying that. Satan, <laughs> what does the Quran say? When you read the Quran, recite the Quran, then seek refuge with Allah from the accursed shaitan and take him. In other verses, he is your most plain avowed enemy. Take him as your enemy. Don't follow his footsteps. Would Satan write something about like him? Like, you know, it totally goes against Satan being the inspirer or the author of the Quran. He's saying, curse me before you read this book. So when the Quran says, even if the whole of mankind and the jinns, the spiritual beings, if they were coming together 
to make something like of this Quran, they would never be able to. When the Quran yes. says, if you're doubtful about this book, it's not from a revelation, not from God. This is how you can falsify it. Bring a Quran like it. Bring a book like it. Bring 10 chapters like it. Bring one chapter, one surah like it. Or you can't do it yourself. Go and seek your helpers and supporters to do this job. Besides Allah. And if you cannot do it, and you will never be able to do it, then fear the fire whose fuel is man and stone. And especially talking about fire, when the Quran talks about the punishment of hellfire, if it wasn't a revelation, how would people normally say it? Oh, I'm going to punish you with fire and that's it. You know what the Quran says? As often as the skin is roasted through, burned through the fire, God will recreate fresh skin so that they may change, they may feel the chastisement, the punishment, the suffering. Let me hear what Ryan has to say. I think he wanted to say something. Go ahead. Now, sir, given, I think um, the only thing that we needed to accept it is just like, just to verify if these accounts are true and think if the accounts are really true and historically verified, I think that would be enough. So now I think what I would do now is just go and research to see if like these accounts can be trusted and perfect do that and and do me a favor stay sincere stay away from non-islamic non-authentic sources because you can't learn you can't you learn islam from from people that are obviously non-muslim or islamophobes or whatever For and sure. third visit a masjid bro go hang out with with muslims come back to our channel like talk to us more often you're welcome to my channel as well have dialogue shoot us an email you this is and, and correct me if i'm wrong have you ever sat down this long with a group of Muslims before? Uh, no, no. No. Okay, cool. Are do we sound crazy to you or like some weird are we is is anything that we're saying like yo these guys are you know a couple bricks short of a full house kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? No. So spend some time with Islam. Go revisit the Quran, go read, go see, take a look at the Sira, look at the look at the things that are that are available to you and utilize us as resources. We can fast track your research. But again, we don't want to just tell you, "Hey, believe because we tell you to." We want it to come soundly into your mind and into your heart. And a reminder that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says that he will make the signs apparent to, to them both externally and internally, meaning you'll see things from the outside and you'll also, it'll agree with your inside, right? If, if, if you're in that loop, man, if you're, if you're driving the car on that track, so to speak, you're there, don't delay, not even for a second, not even for a second, because once you recognize it and you've internally accepted it, you're now gonna be held accountable to it. I just have one question before I go, just Inshallah, one question. Okay. It's a bit about Christianity, so, I just wanted on the Islamic point of view, like how do you make sense about the early Christianity? That why, why were there like so many debates about Jesus being kind of divine? Why did all these groups all seem to see Jesus in a semi-divine way? Like yeah, the, sure. the Islamic point of view, like for sure. You, to me, this is just me personally, Brother Mansur can answer his way, but look, man, I've got my MacArthur study Bible here, and I've I've been to church sessions and I've talked to many people. Uh as a matter of fact. You know, subhanAllah, just this last weekend, I was invited over to a friend's house and uh, his mom was supposedly 30 years on missionary service. And you know how, how the conversation started? Straight up, I'm not going to lie to you right now. She goes, I was 23 years old doing lines of cocaine. And then all of a sudden uh, I had this experience with God and all of a sudden I had to go down this route. And from going down this route, I studied um uh different different things on christianity and then i started speaking in tongues and i said okay um tell me more because <laughs> i started giving her dawa right i started you know and then we, we we had an exchange now so here's the deal i genuinely think people meant well meaning like let's say that there are two two guys right at the time of isa Salam, you and me right and we're best buds and it took it took us three months of travel to get to one another right and you haven't seen me for two three four five years right whatever a long time and the last time that you saw me you and i buried my mother together right 
And then all of a sudden, it's not like, you know, you can just phone me up and say, hey, bro, I'm on my way, right? You, you come back to my house, it's been whatever, two, three, four, five years later. And you, and, and, and you go, hey, how's things going? I go, you're never going to believe this. There was this guy who was walking the earth and you're not going to believe this, but he actually raised people from the dead. And he said that he can do it all by the power of God and the things that were given to him. And he's conducting all these miracles. My mom is right here. She's right here. And you're going to look at me and go, but we buried her together. I saw her. And no, go greet her. She's fleshy. She's real. She's breathing. She's here, man. She's cooking, right? And then you're going to look at me and go, this is insane. This guy must be like God or something, okay? And then I go, no, no, no. He, he said it, everything's by the power of God, all this stuff, right? He, he didn't attribute himself as God or anything, but, and you're just shocked, right? So you're, you're kind of hearing what I'm saying, but you're also kind of not hearing what I'm saying. Then you leave town, right? You stayed with me for a week, whatever. You're, you're traveling back home. And as you're passing through towns, you go, you guys aren't going to believe this. There's this guy walking the earth and he's raising people from the dead and curing the blind and curing leprosy and stuff like that. Now, the crowd doesn't have time to sit there and be like, tell me more about this stuff. Who is this guy? Blah, 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 blah. No. Now rumors start chirping. This guy must be like God on earth or something. This something is crazy is happening, right? And now you can see how the message got propagated out. This is just a potential way. Because remember, you're dealing with illiterate people that don't have access to information quickly, that can't sit there and do hardcore research into things, right? And they're just going off of second, third, fourth hand accounts, okay? To interrupt the video. But the resurrection is, but claiming that resurrected is another, it's like. <laughs> yeah, but look at what happened to look, all of his apostles, all, all of his disciples forsook him. You have no witnesses to the resurrection. You have no witness. Excuse me. You have no witnesses to the crucifixion. And then when you when you deal with the when you take a look at the accounts, they're completely different. One of them has guards in the tomb. The other one, it's uh, no. One of them's got a fire angel. The other one, no. One of them, uh, uh, two ladies uh, are there. The other one, no. One of them, the tomb is closed. The other one, no. Dude, like, what's what's the deal here? You understand? But. Where I think what happened was, is out of passion, this thing was born. And imagine, like, if you if you resurrected my mom, I would be like, anything you need, man. I will I will wash your feet. I will basically, for lack of a better word, the stuff of the law, worship the ground that you walk on kind of thing. You, you brought my mom back from the dead kind of thing, right? So imagine the polarity, the emotional charge of what's going on when people are witnessing things that are just beyond them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, now, continuing on, and just to shorten it real quick, there's a group of people that are, are bad actors, AKA the church, meaning these guys saying, yo, uh, th we, this is gonna go crazy, like wildfire, we have to contain this in some way, shape or form, we have to give people some type of a direction. Now, ironically, they themselves can't determine what that direction is. They can't determine, are they Unitarian? They can't determine, are they Binitarian? They can't determine, are they Trinitarian? They just can't. And still till this day, there's no unification. You have over 20,000 different denominations of Christianity. You have some, some of them have very, uh, all of them have various canonical books. There's no unification whatsoever. The only thing that all of them can agree on is it's a holy mystery. And we don't know God and Sucks to be us, but we got to work with what we got. You know, it's just really like, if you really think about it on the sim most simplistic way, like a non-academic way, it's just the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. But most people, bro, to be frank with you, they don't open up their scriptures. They don't read it. They don't critically think about it. Like, for example, after today, bro, after today, you will never look at your scripture the same. You'll never be able to read the book of John or the book of Matthew in, in awe, in like, wow, these guys were, and this is so cool, and wow, all this stuff. No, you're going to be like, did that really happen? No, I got to go critically think about this. What about this portion over here? Or how about that? Or how does that? Do 
I promise you that. I promise you, you will never look at it the same way again. And when you leave Christianity fully, meaning like, inshallah, you accept Islam in due time, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you and continue to guide all of us, right? You're going to look back on that day, dude, and you're going to be like, I don't understand what type of veil was on my head. Like, I don't understand what, how, how did I even believe any of this? Or how did I get my, how did I convince myself of this? And you'll start recognizing that it's because of either societal pressure or family pressure or church pressure or something that just has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you, man. So anyway, long to, to cut it short, because again, I can, I can go on forever. I think that somebody witnessed something. They were incredibly passionate about it. The church found a way to weaponize it and said, we got, we got to be able to control the masses. And what better way to do it other than putting both the hope and the fear of God into them. And we're going to mold things our way. It was never a book for the people, by the people. It was always the church, the church, the church, a supreme authority, supreme authority, supreme authority. And you guys are going to get the scraps, which is basically what we're going to tell you to believe. And that's where you're at. And now you're waking up. So... I'll, I'll pass it on to Brother Mansur from here. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what you need to really reflect on. I mean, it was extreme devotion and politicization, if I want to use this word, of the situation that led to a version of the message of Christ that became the orthodox message. There are many people at that time, they didn't believe in what Christians believe in today now. So I would recommend if you have time later for your own information to read about some academic works on the early Christians and early Christianity um, by conservative scholars as well as um, scholars who may have left Christianity. For example, um, uh, Bart Ehrman wrote some books on early Christianity and early uh, scripture in which he goes to show you the development and the progress of how different uh, you know, message of Christ, they were fighting with each other and then one became the dominant. So you have a proto-orthodoxy and then orthodoxy and then with the the help of the state, you know, the leader at that time controlling, uh, it became like official religion to unite everyone and how it became the orthodoxy as we know today. There were people who were fighting with each other at that time. There were, there were people, Christians, who believed in two gods. You would say like, impossible impossible how can they believe in two gods literally literally they believed like that so there were many christians and many messages why because there seems to be quite quite a few confusion between when you have the greek greek or roman world the greeks and the romans with their pantheons of gods and goddesses you've heard of apollo diana iris venus and so on so you're talking about communities from one hellenistic world coming up to embrace christianity they're not totally abandoning their faith they're accepting oh yeah he's the son of god because um you know he has no physical father, which is the case because he was born of a virgin. So someone who was born of a virgin, instead of saying, okay, he is a special unique creation of God, to be understood that way, they said, oh, no, he's a son of God. They didn't mean it in that sense, but they eventually meant it like, oh, actually, no, he is really, really son of God because there's no physical father. And that didn't stop them there. He became God the son because once you become God the son, now you become deified. So this kind of process went along and with excessive devotion, like what he did is in terms of his character, because he's one of the mighty messengers of God in the Islamic tradition. His, his character, his approach to the people, people were mesmerized by what he did. When he went to the people, they were mesmerized. You know, they would just listen to him. They would follow him, leave everything. That's, that's how he was as a prophet of God. So because of their love for him as well, that with the the understanding of like, oh, he is so special. They over elevated him too much to the extent that, okay, they, that, that devotion, that um, respect became so much in that it became like worship. But they did not, they did not consider him like the God of Israel. Okay. But they elevated him somewhere di differently. So if you read some book, how Jesus became God, for example, there are some Christian conservative scholars. I had some of the books, but it's upstairs. I could have shown you. Um, there's a history to this, how he was deified, but they did not consider him the God of Israel, who is the God, okay? But this was called Jesus Olatry. It's some kind of idolatry because of excessive devotion, but it's not something where they were worshipping him in that sense. 
So the, the answer uh, the author gives, you know, were the early Christians worshipping the worship of Jesus? No, he says yes or no in, in that sense, because they're extremely devoted, uh, having their devotion to him, but they never considered him to be the God of Israel, which people said, okay, this is the God um, that is going to send the Messiah. So, so this is what happened in history, I'm afraid, because of peoples like this. And the Quran actually recounts them and says, look, don't say that he is God or son of God and so on. This is <laughs> not correct because he was the Messiah, mighty messenger, born of a virgin, but he's still and a human being and they both ate food, him and his mother. So the Quran acknowledges the historical misunderstanding that happened because of people's uh, you know what happened how people reacted to him but the people who believed in him his disciples <laughs> because if that was the case do you think people like judas will ever according to the tradition disobey him uh, or what's this word um, you know how he um, sold away his faith mm -hmm. and what was this word uh, brother norris uh, judas is carrying out who is what's it called that what uh, are we talking about the the uh, money for the temple? No, no. What what do you call them? Someone who does that? Um, traitor. Traitor. He would not have betrayed if he was indeed God on earth. Those people would have behaved like that, and he would. No one would have. De Imagine Ryan. You were there at that time, and you knew he was God or Son of God on earth. Would you even think and imagine to go against him? you turn into a, you into a potato you know that because that's what god has the power to do so but look how judas iscariot apparently betrayed him so even them they never considered him to be god and someone like that at all I mean, his disciples you know did they really fall on his feet and worship him nothing like yeah that. like i'll i'll just leave you because i don't want to inundate you and, and i i'm sure we have to get over to our next guest but yeah, yeah. if we go to matthew 16 I think it's Matthew 16, 20, um, Matthew 16, 22. But there's this whole thing about like, you know, how Isaiah and the suffering servant, because I, I think you might like prophecies and stuff. But what's strange is like Peter rebuked Jesus when Jesus told him that he had to, supposedly Jesus told him that he had to be this, you know, sacrifice and suffer and then be killed and stuff. Yeah, and, right. The yeah, and Peter rebuked him. Like Peter was like, like god forbid like this say this will never happen to you kind of thing and it's like Let me sit bro, if you're if you're expecting this you would have been like right this way sir like i you know come on down and just prove it prove to us exactly what was supposed to go down and then after pray like before that like literally just a couple no, seconds no, no, before no, that no, he was no, praising no. him he was praising oh, peter no. and then all of a sudden he turns into like hey you're the devil like get it's away from me. Like, you know yeah. So the stuff it's like, bro, these are your these are your apostles, right? And then all of a sudden, right after that, it's like everything's everything's cool. Let's just keep on, you know, let's keep on trucking. Like, man, it just doesn't make any yeah. sense. So yeah, I hope yeah. this answers your question, Ryan, in terms of what happened in early Christianity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have to take more of the time. Thank you, no, guys. No, that's okay. fine. Look, look, we we are honored to speak to you to at least clarify the misconceptions that we have and be in part of your journey in discovering Islam. We, are, we, we really feel honored to have that conversation with you. So don't feel that we've, you know, you've wasted our time. Um, in fact, this is the least we can do to help people, to support people in their journey, to discover the truth for themselves. Yeah, because bro. ultimately, we don't want anyone to go to hell. We don't want anyone to suffer in the fire of hell. We want people to be saved from this punishment that God has reserved for who? The arrogant, stubborn people. So we don't want to be in, in these shoes. So if we are in any way, in any shape, at least shown you and given you some light to, to do your own research, to come to this truth and realization, then, you know, we think, you know, at least we've done Alhamdulillah. something. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, everything will go according to that. Inshallah. 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 We want to see you as a Muslim. Be sincere. Next year. Inshallah. Yeah. Ryan, just be sincere and pray to Allah. You know what I mean? Pray to Allah. Allah is all hearing, all seeing. Okay? Pray to him and seek guidance from him. And inshallah, he will see, uh, show you guidance. You know, it doesn't matter how we can, how much we can talk to you. We, can, we only convey the message. But guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why it is important that you seek his guidance. Okay? 
Okay. All right. It was Thanks. a pleasure speaking to you, Ryan. You take care. And take I care, my friend. You, um, you, I open up your heart and guide you. Okay. I mean, I mean. Take care, my friend.